Okay, chapter 12, the reunification and renaissance in Chinese civilization, the era of the Tang and the Song dynasties. <clears throat> okay, before uh, we were in the um, classical age with the Qin dynasty and the Han dynasty, and with the collapse of the Han dynasty between then and when you have the Sui dynasty beginning, what you have is called the era of divisions or uh, the six dynasties. The reason we don't cover these six dynasties is because of um, the fact that they weren't major contributors to Chinese history, they were also minor in scale between what the Han was and then what the dynasties we're going to be studying now are. There was also a time of fragmentation and a lot of division between uh, China. So um, during the Sui dynasty, the beginning of it, when Di is going to come to power, he is a nobleman uh, who has a lot of connections and ties. He's able to lead nomadic leaders to control northern China and he will defeat the Qin Kingdom in 589, and um, also using marriage, which was common during this time period, he would have his daughter marry uh, to gain more power and more land and control, and then he kicked his son-in-law off the throne, and he takes it, establishing the Sui Dynasty. The border is in red, uh, the, tang is, the Tong is in orange. All right, um, <clears throat> shortly after that, um, after the Sui dynasty is uh, beginning to emerge, uh, Yang Di, his son, is going to uh, kill him. Uh, I'm not sure why, but Yang Di will then take the throne and um, will establish legal reform. So he's going to help unify China by giving them more stability and more structure. Remember, the time before this was an era of division. All things were being uh, divided up. There wasn't a lot of unity. Uh, different uh, legal codes in different areas were being established upon these other dynasties. And uh, so he's going to have a sweeping legal form that's going to unite uh, the majority of China. He's going to reorganize Confucian education and reestablish the scholar gentry, uh, which is going to help with your bureaucracy. He's going to start to remove the aristocrats and um, place in your scholar gentry. Uh, Luoyang is going to be the new capital. Don't uh, worry so much about all the new capitals. Worry about the cultural aspects that was occurring and the significance uh, in these areas and the population shifts with demography with these areas, not so much the specific capitals themselves. Uh, building projects were occurring under uh, Yang Di with uh, a Grand Canal that was being built from the Hongqi to the Yangtze River and connecting north and south. This is important because it's going to allow produce from agriculture to flow north and south. It's also going to help migration from uh, the overpopulated south to be able to migrate northward as well. Uh, he's going to have uh, a military campaign to take over Korea, and that's going to fail. Which, after that, the Turks are going to see the weaker military, and they're going to come in and defeat them as well um, in 615. Because of the amount of money being spent on the building projects, uh, it was more than just a canal. You also had a lot of palaces, the new capital. Um, and then with the defeat with the military, uh, his advisors and ministers are going to assassinate him in 618. It looked like we were going to have another time period of chaos and era of divisions, uh, but a strong leader, Li Yuan of the Duke of Tang, is going to establish himself with military force, and he's going to expand the borders all the way to Afghanistan in the west, um, and he's going to reestablish the borders at the north. He's going to use Turkish armies to accomplish this, he will go into Tibet, Vietnam, Manchuria, and Korea. He's also going to repair a lot of the Great Wall that had been diminished over the centuries. And when he repairs them, he not only repairs them, but he also stations troops there, which is important because a lot of um, a lot of the time during the Era Division, they were just hoping that people would have to try and get around these walls. Now they're having troops stationed there as well for better defense against the northern areas. The rebuilding of the bureaucracy that was just mentioned that was started with the Sui is going to continue under the Tong and bring greater unity with the Confucian ideology being revised. Uh, you'll have a bureau of uh, censors as well that's going to aid in helping with this unity of your bureaucracy. Uh, there's a map uh, showing the size compared to the U.S. and another map with the boundaries also reestablishing that Silk Road that I'll mention in a few slides. 
Right, under that growing bureaucracy and continuing with that, you're going to get a more uh, structured examination system with the Ministry of Rights, and they will be the ones administering the test. No longer is it just one test that you're going to take. You're also going to be uh, taking different levels now, depending on the position in the bureaucracy that you are holding, eventually making it to a Jin, a jin Ji, which was the uh, highest of the scholar gentries that you could make it. Uh, technically, it was still on merit, just, it had, just as it had been under the Han Dynasty. Um, but in reality, a lot of it was still focused on birth and a lot of it on connections of who you know. So there was still the possibility that someone could still fail one of these exams and still at least get a lower position within the scholar gentry. Uh, state and religion, under the Tong and the Song eras, you're going to have Confucianism and Buddhism as potential rivals during this time period. Under the era of divisions, uh, because of the chaos, because of the war, Buddhism is going to uh, come in and become a major influence in Chinese civilization. It gives people an escape from um, the chaos and um, the depression of that time period that was occurring with all of the war and the violence and um, the non-structure. And so Buddhism was kind of um, a safe haven from all of that. Mahayana Buddhism is going to become popular during that turmoil. Uh, one of the reasons is it was called Pure Land Buddhism, uh, which was referring to the salvation of, um, of the people and also the fact that it was Chinese. They were having Chinese qualities, trying to make it more their own because that was one of the things Chinese, as we talked about before, aren't liking the foreign cultural aspects, and so they want it to be their own, and so they're kind of making Buddhism their own. We'll also have the development of Zen Buddhism, which was common among more of your upper elites, your aristocrats and scholar gentry, and it was more of a meditation, somewhat similar to what we have today with Zen Buddhism. The early Tang are going to uh, support Buddhism, uh, especially Empress Wu uh, from 690 to 705. She is going to support monasteries by um, granting them land, giving them loans and money to aid them. Uh, and even at one point, she's going to attempt to make Buddhism the state religion. She comes extremely close to being able to do that, uh, but falls a little bit short. Um, by 850, there will be 50,000 monasteries in China, which is going to start to cause this rivalry between the Confucianism and the Buddhist uh, people in the administration. So what we're going to see is Confucians are going to support taxation of Buddhist monasteries. What was happening is when these Buddhist monasteries were getting established, they weren't being taxed. And so they had large, enormous estates not being taxed. And then when people converted to Buddhism, they would donate their land to the monasteries. And so now that land wasn't being taxed. And then a lot of the peasants and people doing, uh, donating their land were then going to join the monasteries and they were going to um, start working on them. Well, when that occurred, those people weren't being taxed for the job that they were doing. So the Confucian scholars saw this as um, a loss in revenue for the state. And under Emperor Wu Zong, he is going to have mandates to destroy a lot of the monasteries and redistribute the land. So now that land can be taxed, and then the people working on it were going to have to find new work. And so therefore, now you can be taxing them with on their income. And so a lot of it was more your power of income than it was any kind of philosophical um, approach. Because one of the things they did was um, try and paint Buddhism as more of a foreign and bad thing than it really was, all because they were trying to reestablish power here. From that point on, Confucian will emerge as a major ideology, um, even up until the modern period. Uh, under uh, Emperor Zongzong, Zong, uh, for 713 to 756, that is going to be the height of the Tong power. And you will have um, a love story that's going to emerge that's going to start the decline of... Okay, um, and so with that love story, you're going to have a little bit of a decline here um, afterwards. And um, in 907, the last Tong Emperor is going to resign. Um, Tezu will come to power in 960 and he will found the Song Dynasty. And right off the bat you're going to have some struggles here. Uh, the Leo Dynasty in Manchuria is going to uh, want to invade and so what's going to happen is that the Song Dynasty is going to have to pay tribute for them um, in order for them not to invade and attack and take the lands. 
that's going to set a precedent and other boundary areas are going to start to put the same pressure on the Song Dynasty as well. Here's the Song Dynasty, significantly smaller than what the Tong Dynasty had been. There's a comparison map for you as well to look at. All right, the scholar gentry under the Song are going to be patronized and they are given power over the military, which was good and bad. Uh, the government's expanded, however, you're weak in the military. And it was expanded so far that um, it kind of weakened the positions that the scholar gentry had. They weren't doing as much, therefore they became placent and your government became stagnant in its developments. Uh, there will be some revival in uh, Confucian thoughts of the classical age and new Neo-Confucianism will emerge. And under that, it will stress the personal morality, the importance of philosophy in everyday life, the hostility towards uh, foreign ideas, which is where you get some of the backlash of Buddhism. And you'll also have gender, class, and age distinctions that were reinforced. And we'll see the um, we'll see the role of women start to diminish during this time period. And we'll look at that in a few slides with it. Um, again, on the borders, the song's still dealing with having to pay tribute. This is becoming something that's straining on the dynasty, and Wang Ashani comes to power, and he realizes that. And so he decides to bring sweeping reforms. Um, he decides to bring reforms within the Confucian scholars and chief ministers, and uh, where before I just mentioned that the government was expanding too much, he's going to try and bring some stabilization there. Uh, you'll also have support of agriculture and expansion using that canal from the sway with irrigation systems and landlords and scholar gentry will be taxed which obviously kind of um, was the kind of the thing that started to really put some pressure on him and once he died in 1085 all this is, all of his reforms are going to be reversed which actually turns out to be bad because the song are going to start to end up suffering even more because of that the Trojans are going to defeat the Leo, which were in northern Manchuria that was just mentioned. And in 1115, they will found the Jin Kingdom, and they will invade China and take over northern China. The Song will flee to the south, reestablish a capital at Hongzhou. And the southern Song Dynasty, 1127 to 1279, will actually be their golden age. That's when they will prosper the most, produce the most arts and literature, and flourish for about another hundred years. Here's the northern region that they do lose. All right, Tong and Song prosperity. I mentioned earlier the canal system that was being built. You'll have commercial expansion during this age with the Silk Road being reopened. So you'll have contacts with India and the Middle East. Um, and then, of course, that's going to be spreading even all the way into the Mediterranean parts of Africa. Sea trade will develop and the junks will be formed. Those are their sea vessels, which in comparison to the Middle East Dows, were probably the two greater ships, and one could even argue that the junks were more superior because they were going to add rockets onto their ships. Uh, Gunpowder had been used in fireworks, and now we're going to see um, it actually be developed into a military aspect. Uh, commerce will expand with uh, credit and flying money, so uh, the establishment of paper money was developed, which is going to aid in uh, commerce and traveling and spending money. You're also going to get what were pretty much equivalent to shopping malls. You're going to have a lot of individual shops. You're also going to have restaurants, uh, entertainment and opera, uh, and it plays. And so nightlife was actually expanding in these cities. Um, you can look at Chang'an and even the uh, song, uh, later song, the southern song's capital of Hangzhou, um, having in the millions in their population compared to only just 100,000 in Europe. We're looking at 2 million here in China. Um, as I mentioned earlier, agriculture is going to expand. The scholar gentry is going to expand. Uh, with that expansion, there'll be some land reform. So a lot of peasants are going to get some of the land that was taken away from the nobles during that process. Uh, family and society, you're gonna have great continuity. Um, even in marriage, women are going to receive more roles during this time period in the fact that they are able to divorce as well. Um, we mentioned elite women with Empress Wu, there's also Wei, uh, and then of course we have the love story with the mistress. Uh, I mentioned earlier you're going to have a male dominate society eventually with Neo-Confucianism, and what ends up happening is women are going to become more confined. Um, just like we have the harem in the Middle East, you're going to have the harem in China as well, where women were secluded in the palaces. Men were allowed great freedom, even in some cases they were allowed to have multiple wives. 
and uh, men were favored in inheritance with divorce. Uh, like today, women would be the ones who receive the inheritance. They would re maybe receive the kids. Um, they would receive more of the money, maybe even the house. Um, it was the opposite uh, in China during this time period. The men were the ones receiving it. Uh, women were not, were not allowed to be educated dur during this time period, so more and more women are losing their rights. This will also be the age of foot binding, which you guys should have studied last year. Um, but again, it's just more confinement to the home with the pain that it causes to move and travel. Uh, the age of, um, this is an age of, um, of artistic creativity though. You're going to uh, be able to see that because of the agriculture and finances being so well developed, people are able to patronize the arts and support them. And so we'll see a lot of literature. Uh, Lee Bo, one of the more famous poets during this time period, the scholar gentry are going to become your major artist in painting scenes, uh, painting secular scenes of uh, nature and activities of that age. Um, I've mentioned explosions uh, with the gunpowder. Uh, the compass is going to be established on your ships for navigation for seafarers. Um, the abacus, which was pretty much the precursor to a calculator, it was the sliding beads that they have, um, and movable type was developed as well. And I've included a chart of inventions of the Tong and the Song uh, dynasties for you as well. And that will conclude chapter 12.